My name's Neil Brenner, and uh, I'm going to talk about madness in 19th century opera. Now, you all go to say to me, so what's the point? Why bother to talk about this? What is the interest? Well, you're going to see in a minute why. But what we have to remember is that opera, particularly in the 19th century, was a major art form and a form of communication. And that's why it has relevance to us now. Now, we are, and this is the first time this has ever happened, in really lucky that at the end I have a live performance uh, of the mad scene from Lucia. Dilemma. We're going to be talking more about that in a minute. So I'm going to rattle through some things quite quickly so we don't run out of time. Because this is quite exciting. Um, so, I don't know how much of you know anything about opera, so I'm going to have to start at the beginning, take you through it, and hopefully you'll start to understand why we're bothering to talk about this. So, the first question is, what is opera? Opera, in, Wagner defined it as the perfect synergy of music and theatre together. But it's also about storytelling. And that sense of storytelling gives us a lot of information. Opera starts in the mid-16th century, mainly in Italian courts, and it was all about politics and marriage. It was singing, storytelling, and it was all about power, gods and monsters, and had very little reference to anything that was going on in the rest of the world. In the 17th century, it starts to become more popular in Europe as an art form. The first public opera house was built in, uh, I think, about 1660 in Venice, not in Little Fienza, but around that time. And it suddenly takes off as a major form of music and explanation. And it first comes to England in the middle of the 17th century, and we start to see the great rise of the opera houses in England, uh, particularly the competition between Covent Garden and uh, the Haymarket Theatre, one run by Handel, another one by another opera composer, and becomes very big. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And in the 18th century, it still becomes even more popular, and into the 19th century, where you get the grand operas, which we'll talk about, and into the 20th century, where we get what I call the psychological operas start to develop and you move away from uh, 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 illness, uh, disease into mental health. Uh, in the classical Baroque period, you've probably heard of Handel, who wrote a series of extraordinary pieces into Maestro Gluck and then into Mozart. Uh, Mozart only wrote one mad scene. He attempted to write one mad scene, and it wasn't very good. Uh, in the Domineo, it's not really his best. Then you get what's called the bel canto operas, which is what we're going to be talking about. Bel canto, beautiful singing, okay, operas. And you get the famous Rossini's, Donizetti's, Bellini's. And then you move to what many people call the golden age of Verdi and Wagner. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about them in a second. And then into what I call the French operas, the very large affairs of Meyerbeer, Guno, and such like, where you would have casts of hundreds, including the whole opera to stop and have a ballet in the middle of it. The French were absolutely obsessed by that. And, yet, uh, and then you get the early 20th century, Puccini, Strauss, and Berg. And then into the middle, later 20th century, where you, you get people like Benjamin Britten. So... Some of you will know the different type of voices. There's the soprano, the highest end of the range, the mezzo-soprano, the tenor. We all know the famous tenors. And then the bass baritones. And then the other person to think about, you might not know about, is the countertenor, the most amazing sound. And it's uh, a man who uses the, the falsetto part of the voice and sings uh, in uh, uh, the... Uh, 18th century, this would be the castrati. Uh, but now, the rise now of some of the most amazing, if you ever get to hear great countertenors, it's an extraordinary sound. Uh, and opera is divided into two types of opera in the 19th century. 
uh, 18th and 19th century, the opera seria, the serious operas, and what's called the opera buffo, the funny, light-hearted operas. Now, sometimes there's a mixture between the two. And within an opera, there are two parts. There's the aria and the recitative. The recitative takes the story along, often accompanied by a harpsichord uh, and a singer will tell a bit of the story. And then you get to the aria, which is where whatever character will express about feelings and emotions. And that's important. It's about feelings. It's not about taking the story forward. It's about feelings and emotions at that point, whatever it is. And in the uh, 18th century, at the end of an aria, the, the singer, whatever, the, would leave the stage. And that would be it, until you get to certain types of operas where the story is more important. Now, in Handel's operas, the stories are complex, convoluted pieces of work where the story is quite often almost inexplicable to us today. But that changes a bit. In the early 19th century, there is a change. And opera is becoming increasingly more popular, increasingly more available. And we think of opera now as being a very elitist art form because it's expensive to go to the opera. In the 18th century, 19th century, yes, it was expensive for the expensive seats, but the cheap seats were considerably cheaper and there would be a mass following. And when you get to Verdi, the operas become quite political. And that's important because a lot of Verdi's operas had a subtext and they're known as the Risottimento operas, the unification of Italy, communicating a whole load of thoughts and ideas about Italian politics. So much so when Verdi writes Nabucco, and you've probably heard the chorus of the key Hebrew slaves, there's a riot afterwards into Milan, into the streets, and if you know, uh, anything about Italian politics now, Italian, the chorus of Hebrew slaves is something like a second national anthem in Italy. And it's still, and so there's a political edge to communicating information. So when we get to the early 19th century and we start talking about mental illness, such as madness, it's a way of communicating the current thoughts and ideas about what mental illness was and understanding. Now, this makes it more interesting when you come to the idea of hysteria, and I'm going to talk about hysteria and miasma. In the 19th century, up until the end of the 19th century, hysteria was a woman-only illness perceived as. Only women could become hysterical. Okay. It, that's where we get the word hysteria from, hystros, the womb. Yeah? In the early uh, Greek medicine, it was believed that the organs were tethered to the in the body, and if they broke loose, they would wander around the body and cause a disequilibrium of the humors, the fluids in the body, leading to illness. And the, the, the woman-only illness the wandering womb, hysteria. And it wasn't until Freud went and uh, studied with Jean-Marie Charcot in the late 19th century in Paris um, and learned this technique called hypnosis. Freud was said to be a bad hypnotherapist. So he went back to uh, Vienna after this and uh, developed his new idea of free association. But with it was still believed that women only could get hysteria. And this influenced a lot of how madness was seen, particularly when you get to opera. To be a heroine in early 19th century opera normally mean you died. You were a soprano, you died either unmarried or on your wedding night or something related to that. <laughs> yeah? Because it was believed that the lack of sex and the fact that you were property of men, don't forget, women were perceived in this point as just being property of men, led you to be frail, 
easily subjectable to illness, and the illness would be hysteria, and that you would become hysterical and could lead you to die. So there was this belief that uh, communicated that particularly women were vulnerable to becoming mentally ill, men went to war, and women became unwell. So we get to the rise, of, and this to me is the first of the mad scenes in opera. It's a little bit before the 19th century, it's Handel, and his opera called Orlando. It's an odd piece, convoluted story, but it's not, it's a precursor to the rise of the great mad scenes. In Orlando, the prince goes mad for love of a woman who he thinks is a shepherdess, the rural operas, rural stories, but that's actually really a princess in disguise. And he goes mad, and it's a pastoral opera, but he's restored to, ma uh, to sanity by love. But often, in this time, the person playing the prince was a countertenor, therefore a woman, uh, a woman's voice, high-pitched. And when Handel writes it, he tells us about madness, how he perceives it. He writes it in something called 5-8 time. Now, if any of you know anything about music, in a bar, there's certain beats and rhythms in a... Uh, and he writes it so it's disjuncted. So it goes, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. Now, this is really difficult. If any of you want to try clapping it, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. It's really complicated to sing and <laughs> listen to. And it's very jagged and edgy. And this is his belief that this is how we would represent madness. But of course, being a bloke, he's restored to health at the end by love. So I'm hoping we can have a little clip. Can we play that? Is that? I don't know whether we can. No? No, no. Ah, have we got it? <laughs> we got it. <laughs> because I don't want to run out of time. Um, no. How can I move this on to the next slide? No. There we go. Okay. Now, if you remember, you see that it starts off very disturbed, then it goes very serious, and this is called what's called the ABA system, whereby there would be a frenzied bit, sad bit, frenzied bit, sad bit. And we'll come to see this in a second. The next example is the rise of the classical pure um, mad scenes, and I'm going to do two by Donizetti, who was the great exponent of mad scenes in opera in the 19th century. And the first one is Il Puritani, if any of you know it, it's not often performed now. I'm never quite certain why, because it has got some stunningly good music in it. But it's overshadowed by Lucia, I think. Elvira is left at the altar by her boyfriend, her fiancé, literally at the altar, um, because she believes that he's run off with another woman. 
He has, but it's not as a girlfriend. She happens to be the Queen of England, who's escaping the roundheads at the end of the English Civil War, and he's helping get her out of the country. She perceives it as being left at the altar, and she goes really quite mad. But in this opera, which is a rarity, she's restored to health by him coming back and saying, no, I love you. So again, the frail woman becoming hysterical because of love and the distraction of illness. So um, this is a very famous short clip. Now, just to bear in mind, the way this is structured, the musically it's structured, you get a little bit of madness, and then you hear the men singing. The men who are very solid in this, very grounded, very logical. very th So we're telling us about the fact that men are sensible and women go mad. Yeah? And uh, you will hear the solidity grounding of the voices between the men and the women. So I just want to play a small <coughs> section. This is uh, Anna Natrenko, a very famous singer, who is uh, singing the same. She descends a staircase in a wedding dress, having jilted at the altar. She believes.
point. There's a whole load more to go on. Um, uh, and as you can see, we start off with slow, quiet, the men come in, and at the end, fireworks go off when she goes, really. Uh, but it's, it's a wonderful moment. Uh, let's just see, how do we get this? No. No, 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 no. We've got problems here. Yeah, no. How do I get back? Help me, someone. <laughs> okay. Um, the next great 19th century opera with Mad Scene is the most famous. And that is, how do we get back into the name? Yeah, that's it. The most famous, thank you. Uh, Lucia. Now, I, I'm not going to talk much about uh, the, uh, the singing of Lucia because we have the most wonderful treat in a few minutes. Uh, 1838, Lucia is written and is a sensational thing and is still of all, probably the most performed of all uh, the operas. Uh, Lucia, based on a story by uh, Scott, uh, Lucia murders her husband on a wedding night. She is forced to marry a man she cannot stand as a political marriage. She's in love with somebody else. And on her wedding night, she stabs him off stage, unless he's just seen the Royal Opera House production where it's very much on stage. Uh, um, and she descends a staircase in her wedding dress again for dagger and blood all over her, having murdered her husband and is very, very ill. She then dies of her madness. And that's the important thing. She doesn't survive. She dies. Uh, Donald says he doesn't exactly say how, again, unless you're watching a Katie Mitchell production, which is at the Opera House, which is very explicit of how she murders herself, commits suicide. But the important thing is, how does Donald Setti write the music? He writes the music where there's stunning bell cantos singing, flourishes and such like with a very solid, grounded orchestral. But then he adds a flute, what's called an obligato flute, which just hangs in the midair. Because the important thing about madness in 19th century opera at this time is it's about beauty and it's about redemption. You saw in the Il Puritani how stunning the singing is. Very gentle and then goes, yeah. but it's about through madness there is redemption in beauty and death. Purity, beauty, ethereal redemption. Um, this is, and I, I'm not going to play very much of this because we hear this, uh, is the famous um, Sutherland performance, 1956, I think it was, where she made her name literally, literally overnight <coughs> seeing this. But I'm not going to say, because in fact, I, I think in timing-wise, we might not even, but literally one moment of it, because it's Joan Sutherland. <laughs> Which is not going to be as good as what we hear. Maybe we're not going to hear it. In many ways, I'm not unhappy if we don't have this section because we're going to have the live bit in a minute. No. They're not, not available. Well, we're, it's telling us already because we have, this, we have the. So, how do I get back all right? Uh, yeah, we just click next. It should go up. Yeah, here we are. Now. What I want to talk about is something called the miasma theory of mental illness. Okay? Um, this slide actually is from the Katie Mitchell production of the Opera House of Lucia in her death scene, which isn't in the opera, but that never stopped Katie Mitchell. Um, the miasma theory of madness. In the very late uh, 18th century, early 19th century, it was believed that illness and particularly mental illness, was caused by something called the miasma, which was something in the air. They didn't know what, but something in the air sent you crazy. All right? 
And it was all illness was believed, but particularly madness. And that's why in the early 19th century, they start building large psychiatric hospitals in the country, outside. In England, there was a chain of them around the centre of London, in the countryside, because it was believed that if you went to the countryside, had fresh air and such, like, you wouldn't be involved in miasma, and you'd get better. And they were actually had a lot of um, uh, workshops and bakeries and such like that, uh, that would help you get better. Uh, and was very different to how the mental hospitals were about 30, 40 years later, where you get the large Victorian asylums, which were normally built on the same site but expanded dramatically. So when we come to Lucia and uh, Il Puritani, what we see is an expression of the miasma theory of mental illness. That she is sent mad because there's something in her makeup, hysteria, and the fact that there's something in the air that sends frail people crazy. And if Lucia had only got to the countryside and spent time there, she might have got better instead of killing herself. Okay? And this becomes present, prem, prem, really important in the concept of the understanding of mental illness at that time. And this is how it's reflected in 19th century opera, their belief that this was the current thought of treatment. Now, in the mid to end of the 19th century, this all changes. Because what happens is illness kills women, mainly women, but it's tuberculosis. Frail women get tuberculosis and die. So you see La Traviata in 1856, and then you see later on uh, in Puccini, La Boheme, Women die because they're frail and get tuberculosis. So women die because of mental illness, then there's physical illness. Mozart, who we said, tried to write one mad scene, didn't go particularly well. Verdi tried two mad scenes. Uh, one in Nabucco, which is not a great mad scene by any means of imagination, and it's just a plot device. King goes mad, gets better, and everyone's happy. Yeah? Uh, and then he also uh, tries it in Macbeth, but it, it, they don't, didn't work. Verdi stared away from mental illness. He had the project throughout his life, particularly towards the end of his life, of writing King Lear. And he had a whole load of ideas for writing King Lear, but he just couldn't bring himself to do it. He found the subject matter of mental health and Ill, just a little too much to deal with. Puccini uh, stared away, but Puccini had a lot of trauma in his life. Uh, and couldn't deal with uh, the emotional side of that side, so he killed his heroines off of tuberculosis or such like. Wagner is really interesting. Wagner wrote no mad scenes at all, and there is a reason. Wagner's patron was Ludwig II of Bavaria, the Swan King. If you've ever seen any of the castles, the chateaus that he built, Wagner, uh, Ludwig was obsessed by Wagner, and Ludwig was psychotic absolutely quite clear, and committed suicide, or was he murdered? It's slightly controversial. But he dies drowned in a lake, okay, in the 1870s. Uh, Wagner never goes near anything unpure like madness, because it's just not German enough. <laughs> yeah? And uh, none of his, he has right psychological operas, but none of them deal with anything like madness. And it's not until we get to the rise of what I call the psychological operas at the end of the 19th century, where you get, and I'm choosing this one particularly, it's Wozzeck in 1916, written in the height of the Second World War by Alvin Berg. Um, uh, and you get the psychological operas like um, Elektra and such like Strauss. And then the transgender operas where you get people like uh, Strauss writing Arabella, where people are brought up as girls are brought up as men uh, to keep themselves happy. Um, we get Wozzeck. And a Wozzeck, it's not about anything beautiful. It's about hard reality. A soldier in a barracks marries and murders his wife in a psychotic rage and then commits suicide. And if any of you have seen the opera, the very last few moments are horrendous. When Wozzeck is dead, his wife is dead, and they leave a small child who is bullied by some other children. And the opera ends with the child on the stage on a hobby horse, going hip-hop, hip-hop, 
and that is it. Abandoned child. It's traumatic. Gone are the beautiful ethereal sounds that you get in Lucia, Il Puritane, and such like. And you've now descended into hell, which is how the late 19th century sees mental illness. You've moved from redemption to hell. You in there. And this rises with the belief in the 19, late 19th century where we get the rise of all the mental illnesses caused by uh, physical illness such as neurosyphilis. And you get uh, a large number of the asylums that were built in the 1840s, 1830s as places of beauty and rest to the 19th, late 19th century horror stories where people are incarcerated for being single mothers and such like. So, and in England, the Lunacy Act of 1871, which was a bit that really set all of us going. So, oh Lord. <laughs> oh Lord. This was, hopefully, to be a section from Wurzak. I have a feeling we might not get Wurzak. Well, I'll tell you what it does. It, <laughs> Wurzak, having just murdered his wife, in a psychotic rage, goes out into the countryside. This is not rural I idyll. It's harsh. And he goes into a lake and drowns himself. It's violent. It's aggressive. It's not nice. He throws the knife that he stabbed his wife into the lake and then drowns himself. So Wurzak ends in horror, not redemption. Yeah, we're in dirty hell punishment. So, what I want to do now is take any questions of what we talked about, and then we're going to have our live performance. So if there are any questions, I thought it would be nice to do it this way rather than after the performance. Go on. Men were solid. Men went to war. Men achieved things. They were kings. They were people who were going to be uh, lookers after of other people and heroes, heroic. If you see in Lucia, her, the lover is, is desolate by the end, but you don't hear much about him. But the man uh, she's murdered is still seen as something of a hero, uh, purported by his brother. And there are some productions now that add a psychological twist to that, where that she'd been sexually abused by her brother. But there's nothing of that in the opera. In the opera. But men are solid, achievers, warriors. But like in Orlando, so if a man went mad, mm. was there a term for him as well? Well, the, it, the word madness didn't exist. Madness was seen in the late 18th century as being something, uh, a lack of spirituality. You just hadn't prayed enough. You hadn't been good enough uh, person. And it, the, it was seen as a punishment uh, that was meted out to you. But not ne in Orlando, it's not due to frailty. It's due to love. Love sends you mad. But you can be redeemed. And if you're mad. But not in the late 19th century, early 19th century. Um, in many situations, opera, modern operas have not really followed enough about looking at mental illness. They uh, tend to move away to stories where there's a psychological component. Some of them are very powerful. If you look at Janacek's operas, are uh, very psychologically profound pieces, but, uh, 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 but uh, uh, more in the Wozzeck line of um, mental illness being uh, a way that you descend into hell. Many people talk about Benjamin Britten, some of his operas, uh, repressed homosexuality, and that repressed homosexuality leads you to be unwell uh, and leads you to death, Billy Budd, uh, Peter Grimes, and such like. So they haven't followed a trend. Um, mainly, I suspect, as I said, in the 19th century, opera was a mass media version of trying to get views across. Now, opera is not seen. You'll see that much more in film and television of getting that across because it's much more mass media. Um, how, how do you translate Madame Butterfly, where she, she staunchly waits for this man? You know, you're looking at that as a modern woman and you think, you're crazy, he's not coming back. 
There are two things about Madame Butterfly, if you think about it. Madame Butterfly is about cultural and cultural norms and cultural expectations. Okay? She is abused horribly by the soldier who comes, uh, the sailor who comes and marries her and then just abandons her, then comes back later with his new wife uh, and she's been waiting for him. The, the cultural. But then you come to the cultural suicide at the end, which is very much counter. But it always seems to me, Madame Butterfly, that no one really explored the child. Her child is left behind having just watched his, her mother commit suicide. But doesn't the new wife take the child back to America? They want to. It's not explicit. They talk about that as a pause. Now, some productions are very. Uh, others I've seen where the child is just left on stage. I, I just found it interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That she's, uh, but it is about her tragedy, about the cultural norms. <coughs> it's, uh, but uh, Puccini had um, a suicide in his family, and he was very, very careful. He, didn't, he found it very emotionally difficult to write a lot of psychological things. Um, Puccini found going too far into psychological stuff difficult. That's why I wonder whether it always works for him. So, assuming that opera creators were, in a sense, in a very privileged position because they were culture creators and they had access to, you know, bases of knowledge untapped by the others, would you say that misogynistic, <coughs> a more misogynistic communication, like committing females rather than males to madness and suicide and early death, would that be reflective of society at that point or predictive? So would people get into this? I think that this is reflective of what was perceived. <laughs> Women were perceived, uh, perceived as a chattel of men. Men owned their wives, particularly. Once you got married, owned. and men could commit you to psychiatric asylums. OK? Um, it was only 1959 in this country and revived by the 90, uh, uh, put away by the 90, that men couldn't call on a magistrate to have their wife committed. Do you know the best example of that? T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot had his first wife committed into psychiatric asylum because he wanted rid of her, so he could run off of his secretary. Okay? And uh, she stayed there for the rest of her life in the psychiatric hospital. Okay? And that was in the early 50s, before you know. So the it's relatively new that, that this cannot be done. Uh, only in 83 was the change of the 83 Act in this country did that change. So, yeah. Sorry, Can I ask you about Verdi's Otello? Yeah. Is that, is that anger only, or is that oh. madness? Or just well, he never liked, yeah. It, the, the scene in Otello where he collapses is actually an epileptic seizure. If you look at the play, it is a seizure. He has a, in a seizure and a rage. Uh, uh, Otello, uh, it's one of the scenes that doesn't quite work in Otello, is that scene. It, it, I, I think it's actually not his best moment. Uh, and uh, Verdi steered away from it. As I said, and Macbeth lived me to tell, but he also, Nabucco was the one really tempted a mad scene, which, if you ever listen to it, it doesn't really work. It's a, it's a clunky device. In that sense, we go to. What do you think of the solution that Herod found to Salome's madness? Okay, when we come to Richard Strauss, Richard Strauss is on the cusp, but Richard Strauss, who wrote his operas in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was very much in the camp of the psychological opera. Many of them about himself, uh, but in this, uh, a lot of it, but the psychological opera. And uh, his method of getting rid in Salome, which is based on um, Oscar Wilde's play, is that she's crushed to death by the soldiers, and she gets rid of her. Um, she, of course, if you think about it, uh, is an immensely damaged individual, Salome. And Strauss, uh, when she comes to seven, uh, the, the Dance of the Veils, where she dances for Herod to uh, get him to give her the head of John the Baptist, what a bizarre request that she wants the head of John the Baptist, someone she doesn't know, because she feels spurned by love. Hers is a form of almost like suicide, 
asking for this. And, it, it, it is, uh, and Strauss writes it in a very aggressive, edgy fashion. So much so that there is a recent production of the Salome where they don't have the seven dance of the seven veils. They dance of seven scenes from her life leading up, which shows her to be an, uh, a sexually abused and a abused woman and lands up in this situation, which is just an interesting take on it. Yeah. But there's certainly instances where the women are the clever ones, um, it, and it, we're also dealing with addiction. If you think of Don Giovanni, and um, where the women are the ones yeah. who come up with uh, their retribution for, in essence, Don Juan, yeah. and the addiction, the, and sex addiction. Uh, Okay. Yeah. What you're talking about is the difference between opera seria and opera buffo. Opera seria, with what we're talking about, opera buffo, quite often the women are clever and are more agile. But if you think about it, what is the title of Mozart's opera? Cosi fan tutte. What's the da what is that translated as? Thus are all women. And what Mozart gets on is that women are fickle. In, actually, they're not in that opera, but the perception is they're fickle. And they might be cunning, scheming to get their own way, which is normally about marriage. Is it the aspect of addiction, though, interesting? Oh, yeah. Well, we could, that's a whole separate hour just to talk about addiction in theater and opera that yes there are a number of them Don Giovanni is a sex addict out of control there's no question about about that uh, and there's a lot of addictive behaviors in some of them a lot of the, the, the rise of just the drinking song in mid 19th century opera which is all about people getting drunk and only with alcohol can they actually be real uh, so you get a lot of that addiction process in there We'll take one, one more question. Yeah. Um, yes, they talk about that, but is he? He's said to be mad. But let's be honest, Wagner doesn't write him very mad. Wagner was very careful. He wasn't going to bite the hand that feeds him. Oh, so there are two problems. Wagner was German and very Germanic in a period of time where the unification of Germany was coming together and he, would, he had to represent a solid face of Germany. And his uh, Ludwig II, you just couldn't upset him because that's where all the money was. Um, uh, Ludwig uh, basically built by right uh, and, and such like. Um, so, yeah. Um, I always think of Woody Allen's comment about Wagner. Every time I listen to Wagner, I want to invade Poland. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, so uh, I think when you come to Tristan, Tristan is, uh, has a psychological component to it, no question, but I don't buy the madness in Tristan. Right, I think at this point we need to, because uh, I, I can't tell you how exciting this is, because it's never happened, is that we're going to have a live performance of um, the last, the great mad scene from Lucia. Um, Maximilio has very kindly agreed to play, and we have Jesse Tang, from, uh, who is just about to appear in uh, the Netherlands and then goes on to uh, uh, Longborough Opera uh, to sing major roles. So uh, it's just, just fantastic. Now, when you listen to this, can I just ask you to listen to one thing, besides the wonderful thing in the wonderful voice, but how it is written, the structure of the music, the bel canto, the singing, the beautiful singing, but also the ethereal nature, but also that little bit of solidity that is also provided by the orchestra or piano accompaniment. So, um, this is some of the most emotional music. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's uh, and um, I'm not going to say anything at the end because I think we all need a moment to come down from it. So thank you very much.